So some of the constructive feedback I got was, okay, uh, the lecturer never mentioned any of the um, a any of the, the thermal expansion or thermal stress that's coming from thermal expansion. And I think I've explained to people who for brought it up that I didn't cover it because I thought it wasn't that important. And I still believe it's not that important. And I think I might say that much in the overview video. But um, it's uh, something to be aware of, especially for engineers, uh, civil engineers. So, and the, really, this is the role of the textbook. The role of the textbook is to be thorough and comprehensive and cover everything, both the things that are super important and the things that are maybe not as important. <laughs> Thermal expansion is one of those things that should be in uh, the broader breadth of education of an engineer. And at the same time, if somehow we took it out entirely, we can still cover the core of our material, heat engines, without it. So, <laughs> so I do encourage everyone to read about thermal expansion in the textbook. Um, and, you know, there's nice pictures. <laughs> read it through it. Uh, they talk about how such potentials are asymmetrical. And it, there's the whole thing about how enharmonic potentials lead to the thermal expansion. Uh, actually, upper division solid state physics classes do cover that. It's fascinating. And, um, and <laughs> it'll take too much for us to get into that. I guess um, the part that's salient is the linear thermal expansion, which is sort of just an experimental observation that people find when uh, when temperature of a solid object or even liquid uh, increases, they expand, and you can characterize the expansion. And the coefficient of linear expansion is that characterization of that expansion that people have measured. And this is all experimentally determined. I think there's one interesting thing, thing I can say, which is when you look at this table of uh, expansion coefficients, you will see that uh, there's a, a relationship between the values along this column and the values along this column. Most of the cases, if you take the values along this column, multiply by 3, you will get these values. There are some weird odd exceptions. I think uh, I saw one for quartz. Multiply this by 3, and you do that's 1.2, which is not 1. But most other cases, take this, multiply by 3, um, you get that. And there's a reason for that. It's not an accident. It's not something superior. Uh, I guess the way I like to say is there's a calculus reason for that. Let me briefly, uh, quickly demonstrate. So, uh, that's for later. <laughs> what I mean is, um, so imagine you have some a box or a cube of material. Let's make it a cube so, so that it's easy for me to deal with. So you have some material of um, length L and depth L and height L. So it starts out at some temperature T. And it, uh, you know, let's say you increase its temperature. So it goes from temperature T to some temperature T plus infinitesimal temperature dT. Or it could be, uh, it doesn't have to be infinitesimal. Uh, if you don't want to bring in calculus orally, you could start out with, well, uh, some delta T. Some small, but not infinitesimal, change of temperature delta T. That change of temperature will induce um, a change of length. So uh, you will see the length of change from L to L plus delta L, which will be related to delta T through the coefficient of linear expansion. And this will occur to every dimension uh, to a degree if the expansion is uh, isotropic, uh, as your textbook mentions, which is most of the cases. Uh, th there are circumstances where they are not, like uh, crystals um, sometimes don't behave isotropically. Now, with this uh, uh, starting point, we can talk about, uh, with these changes, what do you expect the volume change to be? So we can start out with a description of the volume. So we started out with a volume of, well, it's a volume of a cube. So L cube should be its volume. So we want to describe how much did the volume change 
as a result of this temperature change. So we can look at, well, um, we know what this uh, total amount is. So we can start with that. Um, so instead of the L cubed, it'll be um, L plus delta L cubed. Now, um, <laughs> if you're just looking at this algebraically, oh, let me move this up a little bit, by the way, I'm running out of space. If you're just looking at this algebraically, then it uh, it's, you know, looking a little bit daunting. Although I think I can actually work this out algebraically. Let me just uh, do that quickly. Uh, let me write down pass plus triangle. Is that enough? Or I think that's enough. Uh, let me see if I can actually just write it out. So uh, when I expand this out, it should be L cubed plus 3L squared times the delta L plus 3L times the delta L squared plus delta L cubed. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you could expand it out. And, you know, looking at this, you might think uh, that uh, looks like, um, it, you know, it's complicated. It's not some simple expression. But this is where um, I say there's calculus reason because in the limit, where delta L is uh, infinitesimally small because your change of temperature is infinitesimally small, there's a wonderful simplification that takes place. So uh, that simplification is that we can ignore these terms of higher order, ones that involve delta L squared and delta L cubed. We can ignore that because compared to everything else, it'll be just so much smaller. So we can say, well, that, that, that these are negligible terms. They don't matter. And, um, and we retain uh, one lowest term um, so that we can talk about what the effect of the infinitesimal change is in infinitesimal terms. So this infinitesimal change will lead to this infinitesimal change in volume. And now still looking at this, I think it might look a little bit more complicated. So let me, um, let's see, how do I work this out? I think um, if I do this manipulation, it'll look a little bit simpler. Um, uh, it, it'll look uh, more in line with the language of the thermal linear coefficient of expansion. So I'm just going to factor out this V out of this expression. So I have original volume times 1 plus this ratio, delta V over V. You can verify that these two expressions are equal to each other. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to uh, try to do something similar. So I'm going to factor out L cubed, which is actually, uh, that is uh, original volume. Then what I get is uh, 1 plus, and I do factor out two factors of L. Uh, so there's one factor of L in the denominator that I, that I have. So I have delta L over L, and I still have this numerical coefficient, 3. So when you are looking at this portion here, this can be expressed using the coefficient of linear expansion. And this is the factor of 3 here. It's uh, the factor of three that relates this coefficient of linear expansion with this coefficient of volume expansion. So it, as long as there isn't some weird, odd material property stuff happening, uh, this factor of three relationship is what you expect to have from this uh, kind of mathematical relationship between volume and length. So yeah, so yeah that's... Uh, if you notice that, then great. <laughs> that relationship is definitely justified. It mathematically needs to be there. And in cases where they don't, like quartz, uh, quartz come in crystalline form. And uh, imagine there's something anisotropic happening with the quartz. Um, oh, that was my 10 minutes. I wanted to talk a little bit about thermal stress, but maybe I'll just uh, point out to uh, some sections that you can just uh, look at. So um, you're textbook actually links to the previous um, section of the textbook from previous class, which uh, 
at least in my physics foray, we kind of skip. <laughs> so this is the last uh, subsection in this section, thermal stress, and it goes to uh, original length by methods that you studied in static equilibrium and elasticity. And at least in my physics for A, we do study static equilibrium, and we totally skip out on this stress strain and elastic modulus or Young's modulus. Um, this is also one of the reasons why I didn't want to go too, too deeply with into thermal expansion and thermal stress because uh, it it connects to material we skipped over. <laughs> but uh, for civil engineers and people who do have to deal with the thermal expansion, this is the kind of stuff that you do have to worry about. When I was doing experimental research, I did have to worry about. Um, so the, my experimental research was in atomic molecular and optical physics, laser polarimetry. So when you have a transparent material and there's a stress applied on it that induces something called a birefringence, and um, and that birefringence could be caused by thermal stress. So this is the kind of thing that when you are doing detailed experimental work, that then you know frankly you will educate yourself more than what I could reasonably teach you. So um, so yeah, let me leave that off there. Um, I think that's enough of. Uh, topic. Then. <laughs> um, as I said many times, that's not super important for this class because uh, if we took out that topic entirely, you'll define as far as coverage of heat engines goes.